We're going to read the scripture for today. Um, if you'd like to join, it's Matthew 2, 1 through 23. So I'll be up here for a little bit. You might want to follow along. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I may too come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years, in, two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. A voice was heard in Rama, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. Where is God when people suffer? I realize that even asking this question can conflict with the vow some of us make this time of year of like merry vibes only. We're gonna, only going to talk about like the good and the positive. But we're taking this Advent season to try to better understand this phenomenon of people who are wrestling with, working through, trying to make sense of, maybe taking apart their faith. And if you listen to people who go on that journey, it rarely takes too long before you get to some variation of this question. How can a good and powerful God allow suffering to exist? This argument against God's very existence was made very succinctly and powerfully by a British comedian and actor by the name of Stephen Fry. He was being interviewed a couple years ago, and he was asked, in light of his atheism, a question. And I want you to listen to the question and to his response. Suppose it's all true, and you walk up to the pearly gates, and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? I will basically 
that is the Odyssey, I think. I, I'll say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. I could talk about this interview for hours, from the way it seems like it takes Stephen Fry a moment to almost get into character, to muster up the sort of self-righteous indignation that he wants to come across, to the utterly devastated look on his interviewer's face. I could talk about this for a long, long time. And again, I recognize this is not necessarily a conversation some of us want to have around Christmas time. We want to focus on what is good and positive. But if we take the Christmas story at face value, at least in Matthew's accounting, we are drawn to confront questions of suffering at the very same time we are celebrating the joy that comes into the world through Christ's birth. These two go hand in hand. Not to put too fine a point on it, but if you have magi up in your nativity scene at home, uh, you're a little bit out of sync with the Christian calendar, but that's okay. Uh, but if you have magi up in your home, you can't think about the magi without confronting this story. What's referred to now in church history as the slaughter or the massacre of the infants. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Now, historians are divided about whether or not this is recounting actual history or whether this is a literary device. It could be that Matthew is just trying to account for some oddities in the Christmas story, that the Messiah needs to be born in Bethlehem, but as a matter of actual fact, Jesus' family hails from Nazareth. Matthew also has a particular interest in seeing prophecy fulfilled. So there are people who say what, uh, what Matthew tells us is actually primarily a literary device, not a recounting of actual history. Because we know an awful lot about the life of this king named Herod, and there is no record of this happening outside of this instance in Matthew. So there are historians and even biblical scholars, even very conservative biblical scholars, who say we shouldn't read this as history. This is likely not something that actually happened. But I'm not quite so sure about that. Because even if we don't have record of it uh, outside of Matthew's account, it is perfectly in line with what we know about Herod as an individual and as a ruler. Maybe I can tell you a little bit about Herod to help us better understand this. Herod becomes king over the Jews, not because he is descended from a Jewish king, but because his father was a, an influential person in the Roman orbit. And at one point, Herod finds himself going into Rome, and he meets with the Senate, and the word on the street is that he probably bribes some senators, and he ends up being appointed king. He's not even Jewish, he's Idumean. And so he comes back to uh, Jerusalem and he sets himself up as king under Roman authority, but without any actual legitimacy in the eyes of the people he's supposed to be ruling. He marries a woman named Doris, has a son with her, his name's Antipater. Uh, but at some point, Herod realizes that his grasp on power, even though Rome is backing him fully, his grasp on power is a bit tentative. He needs to consolidate his power. So he goes out and he has his first wife and son sent into exile and gets married a second time, this time to a descendant of a legitimate Jewish dynasty, the Hasmonean dynasty. So he marries a Hasmonean princess by the name of Mariamne. Uh, her parents were cousins, not that that matters a whole lot to the story, but gives you a sense of how things were going at that point in time. So he marries Mariamne. Mariamne is the descendant of people who ought to have been the rightful rulers over Jerusalem at that point in time. He marries her trying to consolidate his power. She persuades him, hey, why don't you appoint my brother to be high priest? If our family can't be king, maybe we can at least control the temple. So her brother becomes high priest, and within a year, he's dead drowned, probably at Herod's orders. Uh, Mary Amney's mom is understandably concerned. Her son's just been murdered. So she reaches out to, I kid you not, Mark Antony and Cleopatra to ask for help. No help is forthcoming. Herod is still in charge. At one point, he and Mary Amney are living outside of Jerusalem. He goes back to Jerusalem and leaves instructions that if he dies, his helper is supposed to kill Mary Amney, his wife. Not, not great. Mary Amney catches wind of this. She is understandably a little bit upset. 
Uh, and so she starts protesting against Herod. Herod becomes concerned that Mariamne and their two sons might actually take power from him. And so he accuses the three of them of sedition. And he hosts a sham trial that results in his wife and two of his own children being executed. And there were about 300 of his own uh, close confidants who came and appealed this sentence, and he had all of them executed too. This is his family and people that he's supposed to trust, and he is just having people slaughtered left and right. Word of this gets back to Caesar Augustus, who's now in charge of the whole Roman Empire. And Caesar Augustus says, uh, we have to just do a little brief detour into language here. The Greek word for pig is hus, and the Greek word for son is huios. They sound kind of similar. Caesar Augustus hears about what Herod has done to his own children, and he says it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. And I want to just pause for a moment to note just the casual brutality that was pervasive at this point in time. Like, can you imagine hearing that someone has just had their wife and two children executed, and your response is to tell the cringiest dad joke of all time? It is horrifying. But this is the level of brutality that was just taken for granted during that era. And it's not just Herod. It is everywhere. The Roman historian Suetonius tells the story of how this Caesar Augustus, the one who said it's better to be Herod's pig than his son, how he came to power, and Suetonius reports this. He says, a few months before Augustus was born, a portent, some kind of symbol or sign, heavenly omen, a portent was generally observed at Rome, which gave warning that nature was pregnant with a king for the Roman people. It sounds a little bit like the star of Bethlehem, doesn't it? So there's some sign, some symbol, and Rome gets this notification, this warning that nature is pregnant with a king. And Rome at this time is still trying to sort of be a republic, not a dictatorship. And so the senators don't like this idea. So the Senate takes up a bill, and they pass a bill that says no male born during that year is to be raised. So what they say is, in essence, a governmental decree that says any male born in the next year needs to be what the Roman practice was called exposure. They were just simply, this infant child was put outside, either to be adopted, taken as a slave, or eaten by animals, or starved to death, or some combination of the above. And the only reason this didn't happen is there were some senators who had pregnant wives. And so they made sure that this law never actually got filed at the Roman treasury. So it got passed by the Senate, but there's some bureaucratic complexity. They say, we're not actually going to do this. But what Suetonius says, he says, it's not because these fathers cared about their yet-to-be-born children. It's because each of these senators secretly hoped that their son might be the next king. Brutality everywhere. Everywhere. And so I believe it is entirely possible that Herod could have given this sort of order and it would have been carried out and historians did not even notice or care. Tradition says that maybe 14,000 children died. That is not possible. There were maybe 1,000 people living in Bethlehem at the time. You do the math on birth rates and that sort of thing and you come up with maybe at most 15, 20 children who would have been executed under Herod. Doesn't diminish the horror of it but does help us to put it in perspective. And we rightly look back on this with horror, but it is entirely possible for people growing up in this context, in this milieu, that this would have just been like another Tuesday. It's a world of utter brutality. Unless we feel too much sort of chronological snobbery that we have outgrown all of that, I realized as I was preparing for this that I could not tell you how many children have died in the war between Israel and Palestine. I had to look it up. Hamas killed 29 Israeli children on October 7th. And the estimates are that over 3,000 Palestinian children in Gaza have died in the retributional strikes that have taken place since then. Do we know how many children have died in Ukraine since Russia's invasion? I don't. Nor can I tell you how many children have died just in America when at least in the years 2020 and 2021, firearms were the leading cause of death for people under the age of 18. 
And so while I like to think that I am more morally advanced than these people were, I'm not quite so sure. A biblical scholar by the name of Eugene Young Chun Park says that the voices of powerless people are often forgotten, suppressed, and neglected in historiography or writing about history. Their cries turn into silence in the realm of history. But not for Matthew. Matthew refuses to let these cries go unheard. Matthew goes out of his way to point out the casual brutality, the suffering that people are experiencing. And the way Matthew does this, he doesn't just tell the story of children suffering under Herod. He does it in a literary way that weaves together multiple stories of suffering and injustice and brutality. The way the story is told, the fact that the Holy Family ends up in Egypt, all of this calls to mind the stories that precede the Exodus. The fact that there already had been a great imperial leader, this time an Egyptian rather than an Idumean like Herod, an Egyptian pharaoh who had given an order very similar to try to wipe out all of the male infant children. But Matthew also brings to mind the exile. That's where this quotation about Rachel weeping in Ramah, this is a a quotation, a prophecy about the exile. Jeremiah is in a town called Ramah, which was a waypoint as people were being taken in captivity out of Judah into Babylon. And Jeremiah recognizes that Rachel, who as a historical figure is long dead by this point, but is symbolizing the mother of the entire nation, the entire nation, all of the mothers are weeping because their children are being carried in to exile. Rama might have had some connotations in the day with the way that we might think of a place like Auschwitz, a place of nearly unspeakable horror. And Matthew, in these few short verses, manages to weave together this entire sweep of suffering from the attempted genocide under Pharaoh, to the exile under the Babylonians, to the illegitimacy and the paranoia of Herod, to perhaps the way that Rome practiced politics as blood sport, if we take the story of Augustus when he was born. Matthew weaves all of this together and gives us this story of suffering. It is not for Matthew thinking primarily about kids with cancer, but we might say that Matthew is thinking about kids under empire, that this is the lot that befalls people when humans take it upon themselves to try to dominate and to subjugate one another. It is terrifying. Whether the violence is being perpetrated by Pharaoh or the Babylonians, by Herod or the Romans, by Hamas or the Israeli Defense Force, by Russians, by the United States of America, the outcome is the same. Innocent people suffer. Children die. Mothers weep. But perhaps the the scope that Matthew is envisioning is broader than even just the injustice and brutality of empire. It's not just kids living under empire. It is humanity under sin, that this is what the world looks like when we are taken under the authority of, when we are living under the domination of sin, when we relate with one another under the framework, the conditions, the pervasive wickedness of sinfulness. Matthew insists that we take in the world as it really is. He doesn't allow us to turn a blind eye to suffering or a deaf ear to anguish. Right in the midst of this story of joy to the world, Matthew puts this, a voice heard in Rama, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And in taking in this grand sweep of suffering, I think Matthew is implicitly asking the question that Stephen Fry is asking, and that so many people ask when confronting a world with suffering. Where is God when people suffer? Where do we find God in this narrative? Where is God when people suffer? 
And different Christian traditions have tried to describe this in, in different ways. There's one stream of Christian faith that would say, well, God is entirely absent from this suffering. God has nothing to do with this suffering because God is not involved in the material world really in any way, shape, or form. We could call this deism. And even during the Enlightenment, people recognized that nothing comes from nothing. So as they were looking at all the materialistic and mechanistic explanations of the universe, they still had to go all the way back and say, at some point, sure, there probably was kind, some kind of unmoved mover or uncaused cause. Something had to give birth to all of this stuff. And so they called that God. But God's activity was limited, in essence, to putting the pieces together, almost like a master watchmaker, winding it up, and then taking his hands off the wheel. And so God is entirely uninvolved in the universe from a deistic perspective. God doesn't have anything to do with this suffering because God doesn't have anything to do with anything that we do in this world. And I hope it's clear to us that this is at odds with Christian faith. The deistic God of the Enlightenment does not actually come remotely close to matching the biblical portrait of who God is. The Apostle Paul says, in God we live and move and have our being. It's not that God wound up the universe and then walked away. God is still intimately involved. And there are other Christian traditions that would recognize this and say, well, if we want to see God in this story, we see God everywhere. Everything that happens in some Christian understandings or supposedly Christian understandings, everything that happened happens because God makes it happen. God isn't just the initial causer. God is the present causal factor of everything. God does it all. God has directly caused all of this, orchestrated all of this suffering and all of this weeping because somehow this will advance God's own glory. And we can call this Christian determinism. It commonly comes in the form of Calvinism. It says that God did all of this. God's sovereignty means that there is nothing that happens in the universe that God didn't directly decree. And so not only did God cause Jesus to be born into this world, God moved the star through the sky, summoned the Magi, and orchestrated Herod's own evil intentions. God caused them. So who caused the weeping, the lamentation? God did. And some might point back to the story of Pharaoh and say, see, God was hardening Pharaoh's heart. God had this active causal uh, role bringing about this tremendous evil. And there are many, many versions of Christian faith that invite us to think this way. But I believe that this too, just like deism, is not the same as the picture of God depicted for us in Scripture. That the idea of God, God causally determining everything that happens does not actually match the picture given to us in the Bible. Because in Matthew's telling, where is God? If we limit our thinking just to this one specific instance of suffering and misery and death and brutality, where is God in this story? I think Matthew actually challenges us to see God in two places or two levels. It's pretty straightforward to see God in this kind of orchestrating behind the scenes, above the fray role, giving these dreams and visions. God shows up in this kind of supernatural way. God is present by revealing uh, the Christ child to the Magi, and God is present, or God's angel at least is present, in giving Joseph this warning to flee into Egypt. God shows up in this kind of providential way. We can recognize that. But that's not the only place that Matthew challenges us to look for God. Because just a chapter earlier, Matthew has told us that this child, Jesus, will be called Emmanuel, or God with us. And while I don't know that Matthew had all of the advanced, sophisticated Christology that would develop in the Christian tradition later, I don't know that Matthew would really fully be able to say that Jesus is God. I think Matthew is at least getting an initial insight that in some mysterious but very real way, this human child is God. And so where is God when these people are suffering? God is on the run. God becomes a refugee fleeing in to Egypt. 
God is not just at this higher level removed from all human experience, orchestrating, pulling strings, giving miraculous dreams and visions. God is fully enfleshed in this story, and God is on the run. And this is utterly scandalous. Because this doesn't comport or fit with our understandings of who God is. Because if you think about the critique that an atheist like Stephen Fry will level against the very idea of God, he will call into question almost every attribute that we have been taught to believe is true about a being if they're to be considered God. Is God all knowing? Absolutely not. Is God all good and all kind? Absolutely not. Is God merciful? Absolutely not. All of those are disproven because of human suffering in Stephen Fry's thinking. But note the one thing that he will continue to utterly insist on even in the face of his disbelief, is that God must be all-powerful, with power understood as being able to control the outcome of a situation by any means necessary. Stephen Fry refuses to reconsider what God's power actually looks like. He'll question God's goodness and kindness and wisdom and knowledge, everything except power. But the Christmas story invites us to radically rethink what we say when we say that God is powerful. Because God is revealed in this human baby whose family has to flee into Egypt because a would-be dictator is scared, trying to hold on to his power. And it's not like this child comes back and everything goes really, really well in his life. He comes back and gets crucified. And this is a revelation of who God is. This is God demonstrating God's goodness and wisdom and kindness and power. And God's power looks an awful lot to us like powerlessness. And so we can wonder if God can be sent on the run, flee into Egypt by the machinations of a petty despot, does God actually have the power to ultimately make all things right? Do we worship a God who will ensure that at the end of time, all is well and all manner of things are well? Can God do it if God can be put on the run and have to flee into Egypt because of Herod? But I want to interrogate this just a little bit. Because imagine instead that God had chosen a more traditional route to demonstrate God's power. That God had raised up a a, a counter-military to come in and fight with Herod. Or the angel armies had shown up and stayed Herod's hand and ensured that this bad thing didn't happen. What would have been the actual outcome of that? Sure, it would have stopped this bad thing from happening, but it would have re-inscribed, reinforced this human fallen instinct to presume that might can make right. I mean, think about the conundrum that humanity has put God in, where God needs to defeat sin, but if God uses the tools of sin to do it, of superior force, superior strength, superior firepower, is God actually winning? If we're not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good, what is God to do? God shows up in the form of this nearly helpless infant. And his family is sent into Egypt as refugees. And in doing so, God transforms the entire world. This is the way the theologian and philosopher David Bentley Hart puts it. He says, the new world we see being brought into being in the Gospels is one in which the whole grand cosmic architecture of prerogative, power, and eminence has been shaken and even superseded by a new, positively anarchic order. The order that puts Herod at the top and the refugee child at the bottom is entirely inverted because now we look at this refugee child and we say, what if that was God? Hart says, we see the glory of God revealed in a crucified slave. And consequently, we are enjoined to see the forsaken of the earth as the very children of heaven. 
We look back on this story of this massacre, this slaughter of the innocents, and we are horrified. But I believe we are only horrified because God has been revealed as one of these innocents. We are not horrified because God is somehow a stronger version of Herod. Our entire moral sensibility is being reworked from the inside out, from the ground up. It is being reworked because of who God is and how God shows up. Hart goes so far as to say what it is to be human has been irrevocably altered. And clearly we have not been perfected in this yet right? There's still entirely too much suffering and even slaughter of innocence that we allow. Clearly, we have not been perfected yet, but the, the, the transforming power of God has already invaded this world and turned the sensibilities of the universe upside down because now, anytime we are confronted with the suffering of innocent people, we are challenged to say these people could be God because that's how God entered the world. God is on the run. And in allowing God's self to be put on the run, in allowing Jesus' family to be sent into this refugee experience, God demonstrates God's true power and God's desired ordering for the universe. And it changes all of our moral sensibilities. Dr. Munther Isaac, who's a Palestinian Christian who teaches at Bethlehem Bible College, has been reflecting on the terror and horror that his people and Israeli people are experiencing during this war. In fact, many Christians still living in Bethlehem have gone so far as to say that they will not be celebrating Christmas this year in solidarity with people in Gaza who are suffering. And when Munther Isaac is confronted with this question of where is God in the midst of this horrible suffering that human beings are inflicting on each other, he says this. He says, God is under the rubble. And again, this is scandalous if our minds are preoccupied on power and eminence, superiority, prerogative, the ability to enforce our will on others. We say it is impossible to envision God under the rubble, but Matthew comes along in his gospel It says, God was on the run into Egypt. So where is God when we suffer? If Matthew is to be believed, God is also suffering. And in doing so, in experiencing that that suffering and standing in full solidarity with all of the people who have suffered too often in silence and in utter neglect by the powers that be, God is transforming the entire order of the universe and challenging us to look not to the Herods of the world, but to all of the people they harm. Because if we want to see God, that is where God is. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for this miraculous story of how you came into the world, the fullness of God in the form of a human infant. And we confess that too often our focus and our attention is toward that which seems grand and powerful. We pray, God, by the working of your Holy Spirit, that you would continue to build in us the moral sensibilities shown to us in the Christmas story, how Jesus became a refugee. We pray that you would continue this good work by your power, which is entirely different from all the other powers that we know. We pray all of this in the name of Christ.